Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... You were nominated for seven Emmy Awards for New Heart. Uh, does that play with your head at all? Uh, you know, I'll be honest. We're all very aware of the business that we're in. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say there were a lot of actresses in comedy shows then. You're saying it was slim pickings for the Emmy Award committee? Well, I'm just saying there weren't so many women in comedy then. No comedy show had that many women on it. Very few had an actual leading woman on a comedy show. So I'm not saying it was slim pickings. I would say my competition was quite fierce, but not numerous. Has aging in Hollywood affected you? Oh, not at all, Steve. It's been fine. <laughs> yeah, I visited that set once when uh, Marla Maples was a guest star. Oh, I remember Marla. We said to each other, oh, we really have to get some dirt. We've got to get her to talk. And um, that wasn't hard at all. Okay, all. If you grew up on the amazing shows Friends and Seinfeld from the 90s, you missed out on some of the TV comedies of the 80s that laid the groundwork for the genre. One of those shows centered around the driest, funniest comedian of our time, the late Bob Newhart. And on his signature show, bearing his name was an actress, a designing woman, who leapt off of the screen where she stole every scene she was in. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest and groundbreaking actress, Julia Duffy. If you'd like to be more involved with us at Still Here Hollywood, you definitely can. Just visit patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. You can support us for as little as $3 a month. Then you can see who our upcoming guests will be and submit questions for them. You can even tell us what stars you want us to have on as guests. You'll also get exclusive behind-the-scenes info, pics, video, and more. Again, that's patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. Julia, it's nice seeing you again. Why, thank you. It's nice seeing you again, too. Thanks agreeing to do, for agreeing to do this. Yeah, of course. You, may, you jumped right off the screen uh, in the first episode you did of New Heart, which is actually the second episode you did, but it was a different season. Oh, my first episode as a regular after yes. being a guest star. Yes. Yes. When Joanna offered you uh, a job and you said, a maid, oh boy. <laughs> well, that was the job she was offering you. I think everyone at that time knew that a star was born. Oh, well, that's nice to hear. Do you miss the show? Every day of my life. There's never been a job like it. There have been wonderful jobs, but if they were here, they would all say the same thing. Really? That no five people ever had more fun together ever on this planet than we did. Well, it was such a brilliant cast. Everybody was so funny. I mean, they should have filmed the rehearsals. It was absolutely wild. And there were times when we would be laughing so hard. Well, first of all, Mary and I would say, we have to go fix our eye makeup because we'd be laughing so hard we were crying. And in the midst of all of this wildness, Tom would go, and we're getting paid. And that was the whole thing, is that not only would we do it for free, we had so much fun, but on top of that, it had everything else going for it, that job. And it's just hard to uh, top it. And we all knew it, too. We knew it would never be this good again. At the time, you knew? I think we all felt exactly that way. We knew how special it was. It was a, a sob fest when we had to say goodbye. Of course, I've had other wonderful jobs that were very different, but... That was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. That's what you get into this business for. I was so lucky to actually have that. What's it like now? I, I'm. They're all gone, every one of your co-stars. Uh, Bob, not that long ago. What was he like to work with? Oh, my God. He was so much fun. He was probably a little wilder in his humor and person than his very laid back uh, public persona. Buttoned down mind. Yes. 
All we did was chase the joke every day. If somebody said something funny, then we had to take it to the extreme. One time I remember a director actually laid down on the floor and started kind of <laughs> pounding his fists because, you know, we were off and running. But that's what you did. If there was a joke, you made the joke. The joke was king. Nothing mattered but the joke. You went all the way with the joke. How do they corral writers for a show like that? How do they find them to begin with? Well, I think a lot of writers really wanted to write on the show. Bob was pretty hands-off. I mean, you could get a person whose name was the title of the show who's difficult. And I've been on shows like that where that person was in the writer's room a lot, but that wasn't Bob at all. I mean, I'm sure he spoke to them when he had a problem, but it didn't happen on the set very much like that. that he I brought so, mu so many credentials, so many comedy credentials with him. Well, you got to figure he was writing his own material. I don't know what that would be like to... In fact, I asked Barry Kemp this just the other day when I had lunch with him, who was the creator of Newhart, and I said, isn't it weird to be a writer and write for a comedian who's been writing for himself for years? And he said, well, I'm used to it. He said, I'm just used to that now. And I would think that there has to be some kind of a, not necessarily, not, not necessarily a power dynamic, but um, creative differences and creative passions that clash. But I felt like Bob did not insert himself very much. I mean, I think he could have more than he did easily. But I remember every now and then, I, could, I, I, re I have a memory of saying to him, well, why don't you talk to them, you know, if something was bothering him? And he'd say, you know, I just, I really, I hate to do that. So you got to hand it to him. Because he was a writer and had been writing his own material for decades at that point, he sympathized with the writers. That's not something you see very often. I saw an interview with you where you had said, uh, one of your goals in life was to work with Bob Newhart. Is that true? It really was because I would watch the old show and I just got him. I completely got him. And I would literally think to myself, I know exactly how to work with him. I, Because what you do is you set him up. You make him uncomfortable for the reactions. And I thought there could be nothing better than that. Because no matter what you did, you'd be contributing to a joke, to a laugh. And I got that pretty early on, watching that. And I remember when the old show went off the air, and I think when it went off the air, I had just gotten to L.A. or something. I can't remember, because I started in New York. And I thought, damn it, now I'll never work with him. I, I, I had that thought. He wasn't gone for long. No, it was only four years between the two shows. And the previous one had been such a big hit. It also. was. Also. Right. But this was even more so and went on longer. And in fact, they wanted to renew it for a ninth season. But by then he felt that it was played out. He couldn't stand the feeling of, you know, you get off stage. You go. If, if the laughter isn't as good or you, you got to know when to get off stage. And he knew. Um, but he managed to bring Suzanne Plachette in for that final episode. Oh, yes. Uh, I had seen her just the day before it aired at a uh, charity thing in Beverly Hills. And she recognized me. We started talking. And I told her how much I enjoyed, you know, I'd seen the last episode. And she said, you're not going to say anything about it, are you? Mm -hmm. I said, no, of course not. That would ruin it. Uh, it was just wonderful, wonderful, yeah. well done. We all kept the secret. Yeah, uh, which isn't easy to do. Um, when did you last see Bob? Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I talked to him on the phone was the more recent times. And then after he got sick, I believe it was a stroke, then he wasn't texting me anymore. There wasn't. So I was sort of going through his his guy, his PR person, who was like his right-hand man. And then he would respond, or I'd be asked to do something, and I'd send it to Bob. And, you know, it all went through him, and I thought, oh, okay. 
So I was not surprised. Were there times when you couldn't keep a straight face when working opposite Bob? Oh my God. There were so many times. I mean, we all did it. Every single one of us did it. Mary was very good at keeping a straight face, but I, no one else was any good at keeping a straight face. Bob was pretty good at keeping a straight face, actually. Well, he'd been doing it for a while. Yes, he had. You were in two of the comedies, two of the best comedies in TV history, The Bob Newhart Show and Designing Women. Was there a big difference between the two of them and how they operated? Huge difference. Yes? Yes. Um, Designing Women was... It just didn't quite have the same feeling of togetherness, I think, because of cast changes and uh, difficulties that I wasn't there for that preceded me. But working with those actresses was such a benefit. They were amazing. Under any circumstances, they delivered. And uh, honestly, I learned from them. I mean, by then, I'd been in the business a long time and done lots of sitcom work, but I don't know, I just kind of saw a kind of professionalism and uh, a soldiering through that was so impressive and with women. So that, it was new to me. I mean, I sort of learned about being a professional woman from them. I remember when they announced you were joining the cast, I thought to myself, uh, and I remember this, uh, it's perfect, she's perfect. She'll fit in just right. And I thought, I thought you did. And you were able to deliver a, a woman's perspective. I mean, all the, the four of them, or five of them, um, everybody except Anthony, um, were, were able to deliver a, <laughs> I, I, a I learned from Misak. Misak. I, I, I learned from him. Not so much about being a woman, but I learned from him as well because, oh my God, he was the funniest person in the world. Everything he did made me laugh. I mean, if he opened his mouth, he made me laugh. He was one of those. Well, I would imagine. uh, I I also did a story with them when it was very nearly jerked off the air. And a write-in campaign, as I understand it, from viewers saved that show uh, very early on. Mm. So I would imagine that would create more of a binding feeling. Well, I'm telling you, they were like soldiers. They were so trained and disciplined and impressive on a level I'd never seen. Not that they didn't have fun, but I came from a set where we just screwed around all day long. But that was the madness to our method. And they were just unbelievable, steely pros. Very impressive. Yeah, I visited that set once when... uh Marla Maples was a guest star. Oh, I remember Marla. Was she? She wasn't on the show while you were there. But yeah, she was. Oh, she was. She was a guest star when okay. I was there. We said to each other, "Oh, we really have to get some dirt. We've got to get her to talk." And um, that wasn't hard at all. Really? <laughs> yeah. She was delightful, adorable, and uh, just quite open about everything. I think when I was there, she had just gotten engaged mm-hmm. to the Donald. She had. And she had a huge ring. Yes. Good for her. That's right. Um, I liked her a lot. Did you? I did. I could see where that might be a difficult situation. Uh, You were brought on to replace a character. um, Yes. Who was ostensibly your cousin in the script. Uh, That's right. Was it hard going into that at all? Um, Well. Replacing someone? Yeah, because that departure kind of left um, it it was a chaotic apparently and there had been lots of gossip and that kind of thing so it was weird to come into that I wasn't used to that kind of thing at all where there was gossip where anybody was looking for dirt I I had no experience with that at all Uh, but I don't know they all handled it so well And I know that it was weirder for them than it was for me because they'd been through a lot leading up to it. Julia, how did you get into the business? Oh, well, I mean, I grew up sitting about this far from the TV and You didn't have parents saying, you're going to ruin your eyes. No, no, I was right there saying, I could do that. 
I'm sure I could do that. And I would see little girls my age. You didn't see a lot of kids on TV in those days. It, there just wasn't that much young people. Like it, now it's all young people. Um, but I would see little girls on commercials. And I'd think, I could do that. And like a little girl on a shampoo commercial. I'll bet I could do that if I could just get my hair to do that and, and not do this strange flip or something. I, <laughs> Later on, I did like six shampoo commercials when I was grown, grown up. Um, but that was the kind of thing I would think was, I just feel like I can do that. And then I took uh, drama lessons downtown Minneapolis where we put on plays. Uh, mostly children's plays but I don't know sometimes we were playing grown-ups in plays and it was wonderful and I did community theater did you ever work at the Guthrie <laughs> people always ask me that there were oh. barely any Americans working at the Guthrie <laughs> at that time um, I mean Tyrone Guthrie started he was Canadian there were a lot of Canadian actors locals uh, did not work at the Guthrie in those days it's completely different now it, it, it was just a different time. I went to a play there uh, not terribly long ago. Uh, and the building they're in is just oh, spectacular. Isn't it something? Yeah, it is. Uh, beautiful how it sits just over the river. Yeah. Um, and there's even that glass. I know. <laughs> makes you a little nervous to yeah. go out on. It's very cool. Over the river. Uh, but it's a beautiful building and a beautiful um, program they have there. They, what did you see? I saw, oh, please. It was a, a play made from an old movie with Cary Grant. Uh, what's the one where the corpse is in the thing and he lives with his two old aunts? Oh, Arsenic and Old Maids. That's Hayes. it. That's what they oh, did. Oh, yes. I did know they did that. Yeah. I haven't been to a play there in a while. But I go, my family is still in Minneapolis. And oh. I go back. Uh, I, I love that city, except in winter. I know. But, That's why it's a great city. Yeah. Why else would anyone live there? <laughs> right, right. But it is a great city. Uh, like Chicago, same thing. Mm -hmm. In winter, mm -mm. Um, And so you, you saw these people on, these young people on television, and you made up your mind that that's what you wanted to pursue? Yeah, absolutely. There was no question. There was no alternate plan. None. Absolutely not. That, was, that had to be it. <laughs> And so I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and how I found out about that is I had no idea how ridiculous I was being at the time. What did I know? I read a book, you know, those series of books that star teenage girls. They're usually twins. You wouldn't know you're a guy, but we all read those at that age. So I was like 11, and it was the something twins, and there was... The Bobsy twins? No. Oh, I read those too. This is more teenage. See, I read the Hardy Boys. I read those two. Oh, did you? Yes. But the in this book, they were in high school. And I was like 11 reading about what it's like in high school <laughs> from these books. And one of them wanted to be an actress. And she went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And there was a scene in the book where she went to the school and met the head of the school. And I believe now, since I got to know him that it was based on the real head of the school. And I decided that that was where I had to go. So I somehow found their address in the back, back of a magazine where there were ads for schools. And I wrote to them and I got their booklet. And that's where I had to go. So when I was 17, 18, I auditioned and I got in. And the head of the school was just like the guy in the book. So if I hadn't read that book when I was 11, I don't know where I would have gone, but that's where I went. <laughs> and your family was supportive? Well, they kind of had to be supportive because I was broke. Uh, it would be so exciting when they'd write me a letter and there was a $5 bill in it. But I worked as a waitress. and it, I mean, you could live broke in New York in those days because the prices made it possible. I was a waitress. That's how I got through school and paid my rent. I worked as a waiter in Chicago at one point. It's fun, isn't it? Oh, yes. Uh, our, our biggest, the most fun we had once was uh, it was attached to a, theat uh, to a theater. And uh, whenever there was a star performing there, 
they'd always come up to our restaurant for a meal. And the biggest thrill was meeting Phyllis Diller. Ah. <laughs> Um, I worked at Schraff's in New York, oh. which for listeners of a certain age would know that I am a walking cliche. Went to New York to be an actress and <clears throat> was a waitress at Schraff's. We got, uh, believe it or not, celebrities in there. I don't know what they were doing in there, but I guess they were just walking by. <laughs> we waited on um, Mel Brooks and, and Bancroft one night. We took turns. There was a different person bringing them every course because that was the only fair way to do it, is that we all got a chance, so we. What'd you do about the tip at the end? I don't recall. <laughs> Maybe it's best that way. Yeah. We'll be back in a moment. Was there an audition process? Oh, well, it, yeah, it was a guest role, and um, it was a scene with Bob, and it was so clear how to play it, because you had to make him really, really uncomfortable. How was the audition process that got you the role on Newhart? Was there an audition process? Oh, well, it, yeah, it was a guest role, and um, it was a scene with Bob, and it was so clear how to play it, because you had to make him really, really uncomfortable with the way that, the, you know, I behaved, which is that I tell him I have a crush on somebody, and um, he thinks I was referring to him. Oh. So it was a perfect scene to, to know how to, to play with Bob. It was perfect. Yeah, I was watching an interview with the creator of the show, and he said uh, the first time you were on, um, you knocked it out of the park. Well, that's very nice. I, he didn't say that to me the other day when we had lunch. But <laughs> well. I'm happy to hear that. No, he said very nice things to me. We were reminiscing. It was fun. We lost, uh, I think we mentioned earlier, we lost Peter Scolari recently. Uh, how did you come about to play off each other so well? Well, I'd love to take credit, but I will tell you that, and people always talked about how much chemistry we had, but I gotta tell you, I think Peter had chemistry with everybody he worked with. Peter brought the chemistry to the scene. He just did, and it made it so easy. We were two very different people in life, but we heard the comedy exactly the same way, like exactly. We didn't even have to discuss it. We knew what made it funniest. It couldn't have been easier. Um, Peter made a big impression on my parents. Uh, when they came out to visit me once, uh, I got them tickets to Price is Right at TV City because I worked for CBS. And they were going somewhere in an elevator and Peter got on the elevator and started a, up a conversation with them. And uh, he, they told him who they were and how they were related to me. And he sang my praises up one side and down the other. Uh, and every parent likes to hear of course. good things. And from somebody notable, you know, mm -hmm. it means that much more. Right. I just think the world, I thought the world of him. Such a charmer. And after I interviewed him the time I, I interviewed you as well, I just thought, God, this guy's got a lot. Got a lot on the ball. I tell you, I, I think he should have been a bigger star because he had the, the, the aplomb and the charisma of a leading man. But he had a great career playing yeah. such different roles and incredible things on stage. He was really the whole package. He could do everything. And if he, if he couldn't, then he learned it. He was just very facile and smart. Well, you're no slouch. I mean, you were nominated for seven Emmy Awards for New Art. Uh, does that play with your head at all? Uh, you know, I'll be honest. We're all very aware of the business that we're in. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say there were a lot of actresses in comedy shows then. I wouldn't say there were a lot of females on the comedy shows then. And I'm not trying to sound modest. But the realities of the business, you can't ignore they're very uh, obvious to those of us in the business. Are you saying it was slim pickings for the Emmy Award Committee? Well, I'm just saying there weren't so many women in comedy then. No comedy show had that many women on it. Very few had an actual leading woman on a comedy show. So I'm not saying it was slim pickings. I would say my competition was quite fierce. 
but not numerous. When you reminisce about your career, do you think you made the right choice? I never reminisce about my career. How come? I don't know. I reminisce about certain things. Do you reminisce about your life? Yes, much more than I do about my career, actually. I mean, what's more vivid to any of us than childhood, high school? Adulthood, sometimes. Yeah, I don't reminisce so much about adulthood. Oh, no. But the career is just, you know, one thing at a time. You don't know how many things didn't happen. (laughs) Unless someone tells you. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, how many auditions that there were that you didn't get. That's the whole picture. Didn't you write a book called Bad Auditions? Oh, I did. (laughs) Thank you for reminding me. (laughs) I did, although I'll tell you by the time it came out, it was, um, uh, it made no sense anymore because the business had changed so much that, I mean, I hoped that the general idea of it was you cannot be too prepared to young actors. There's no such thing as over preparation. I I hope that got across to anybody who read it. But the business changed drastically with self-tapes especially so that, I mean, you're not in the room anymore for an audition. But I had started writing it in little bits and pieces just thinking about it a long time before it was published. So I didn't quite realize that it was soon going to not be that relevant. Can you tell me what was the worst audition you ever had? Oh, well, let me think. I've got so many to choose from. Um, Okay, I'll tell you about a recent one. No names, however. You still audition? That doesn't seem right. Everybody auditions, Uh, Steve. I suppose life is an audition. Everybody auditions. Okay. Not the movie stars. But then there's a big gap <laughs> that isn't not isn't filled by anyone, and it goes and it start and you go down and it's everybody's auditioning. Um, I know. I, uh, I do think the industry would be better if people didn't typecast so much and were more creative and bolder about casting. And I don't mean so that we didn't have to audition so much. It would be better if there was more boldness and creativity in the world of casting. How do you feel about improvisation? I love improvisation. Oh, I adore it when I'm asked to improvise. Love it. So tell me, what was this recent audition? The recent terrible audition was, um, well, first of all, I really don't feel I was right for it at all, which is true of the majority, I think, but it just happens. And you've got to be a good little soldier and you go do an audition. Because if you say to your rep, I'm not right for it, they'll say, you never know what could happen. So you kind of have to do it but it was in person and it was the first time for me in four years to do an in-person audition and it took me you have an idea from Calabasas to Universal 90 minutes to get there which is double what it should have been even with traffic it was a terrible terrible drive There was nothing I could do about it. I actually walked in at the time of my audition. And I walked in, and I was just frazzled from this horrible drive. And I needed to, like, comb my hair or look at myself or something before I went in the room. And at that moment, the assistant came out and said, are you ready? (laughs) I was barely out of the car. I just walked in, and I said, I I, I just need to, a minute, to powder my nose, okay? And so 30 seconds later, I was ready. And then it took her kind of a while to come out and get me. And I walked in, and the producers were there, which is very unusual. And I said, oh, great, everybody's here. They were so glum. They were so cranky. And they finally went, oh, yeah, okay, hi. I'm told me their name. And I thought, whoa, all right. This is not a great room for comedy. And it absolutely threw me. And I was trying to do it with all my script because I did have it very well memorized. But I was thrown by these very cranky people in the room. I don't know what was wrong with them, but they were very doer. and um, Not a good atmosphere for comedy. Casting lady is, I know her. She's fabulous. But 
I was kind of stumbling through it, and I did not understand why these people were acting like this. And so I was so glad when it was over, and it was painful, and I also felt so wrong for it. And I was driving home, and I went, oh, it was my audition time. And I was called in, and they were told, she'll be here in a minute, she has to powder her nose. They had no idea I had just walked in the door from this ghastly traffic jam. And so it must have looked so shitty to them. And so that was why they behaved that way. Or they're just jerks all the time. I don't know. And somebody who's wildly different than me and a very different age than me uh, got the role, as she should. Well, all's well that ends well. There you go. <laughs> To coin a phrase. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have gotten it if I'd given a great audition. I really wasn't right for it. But anyway. What advice would you give to people who want to perform in comedies? Who want to perform in comedies? Well, you better watch a lot of comedy and know your comedy history because it all feeds into where we are today. The way dialogue is written now is very much in today's vernacular. The jokes that work right now wouldn't have worked 10 years ago, maybe because we're influenced by social media and um, comedians today. But that's not all there is to comedy. And if you want to have a fresh take, you should go back, back, back. You should know who all those people are. Going back to Burns and Allen and, um, you know, everybody. Ernie Kovacs, the whole thing. The Honeymooners. Absolutely. You've got to know the history. You can't just know what happened in the last 20 years. And I do say that, and I did say it in my book. You need to know where we came from. It's important. Humana, humana, humana. Um, what was going through your head the morning after Newhart went off the air? Oh, I felt like I'd lost my family and my, whole, my hometown. That's how it felt. And I started crying, and I said, I want to move back to Minneapolis to my husband. And he said, oh, we will, of course, whatever you want, honey. <laughs> I was devastated. It was incredible to me, such a loss. Obviously, later on, I had good experiences also, and I knew how lucky I'd been. And, but no, none of us were ready for this to end. It was too perfect. Would you tell younger people that today? Would you tell that to a young person coming up? What would you tell yourself about Hollywood, um, your younger self? That you've got to show them because they don't really know anything. That's what you have to do. You have to show them how you would play the role. It's very important because you're not going to play the role in a way you wouldn't play the role. And if it doesn't work, that's fine but you have to be sure what you would bring to the role and go with that and do it fully. And then at least they will see the scope of your talent in that area, whether it's comedy or drama or that kind of a person, that uh, kind of a role, they'll see that and that can help in the future, even if you don't get it. Has aging in Hollywood affected you? Oh, not at all, Steve, it's been fine. <laughs> Yes, it's very awkward because, <laughs> oh my God. Well, I'll tell you something that drives me up a wall because it's symbolic of all of it. I have read for and act actually played the role of a woman who's older that they have named Myrna that takes place present day. Now, I know what people were named who are my age now. We were Patty and Kathy and Susie. That's these women that they write in older roles could have been at Woodstock. If you're having them be 70 today in 2024, you have to write the person and not the type. And it is very disappointing to me how much even younger writers seem to be writing Aunt B or something when they write an older person and not an individual. And I hope they're listening, and I know you have the talent to do it. Make that a real person. Do you ever do any writing? No, except for the book. What's the best item you kept from a set? 
Um, well, I kept the duck from Newhart. There was a carved duck. I suppose it was a wooden box, always on the coffee table. And it may have been meant for like cigarettes or something in those days. But I kept chocolates in there for when I needed a chocolate that I got from the prop room. And then when I was pregnant, Bob left me notes in the they're bad for the baby, <laughs> things like that, uh, so that I wouldn't be eating chocolate when I was pregnant. Bob took the bell on the desk, and he said early on, I'm getting the bell. And I said, okay. So I, I got the duck. I don't know. Everybody grabbed something. I don't know if I ever took anything from another show. I don't recall doing it. How much of a boost, if that's the right word, did Newhart give your career? Um, or designing women? You know, it's kind of hard to know what goes on in those offices and things as far as... You never really know where you are unless you're at the top. <laughs> if you're not at the top, if you're not Meryl Streep, it, you don't really quite understand where you... Where, where you are you in the pecking order? Yeah, where do you reside, actually? And it might be different in different places and comes and goes. So I don't have very much awareness of it, nor do I believe that it's possible for me to quantify it. Uh, is there someone who you looked at and wanted to uh, model some of what you did off of? I don't mean make a duplicate, but someone who inspired you. Well, when I was a kid, um, it was Julie Harris, I thought I was a dramatic actress, and I told this story to Carol Burnett. Um, I saw Julie Harris on a lot of things. You know, back in the day, they would do the Hallmark Hall of Fame live plays mm -hmm. on TV. My mom always watched them. I did. I mean, I saw her do A Doll's House, and it was uh, very impactful for me. So I w was going to be a dramatic actress like Julie Harris. And uh, at the same time, I was watching the Gary Moore show. And when Carol Burnett left to do Once Upon a Mattress, I was extremely upset <laughs> that she wasn't going to be on the show anymore because I was crazy about her, which tells you something. I didn't see that many funny women, you know. And Imogene Coca, I was mad for Imogene Coca, although I was really little when she was on the air. But I caught up later on. I mean, I own all of the tapes of your show of shows. And my mom would say to me, you know, I think you should do comedy. And I thought, oh, I'm a dramatic actress. Doesn't she know that? And I think she knew what she was looking at. I think she got it. They're always the last to know. And I did one time. I was like this far from Imogene Coca after some kind of an awards event. I can't remember waiting for our cars, and I just could not screw up the courage to talk to her, and I regret it. I did um, meet Sid Caesar, who I was quite enamored with, and I told him what I thought of Imogene Coca. First of all, he said, I can't believe you know who I am, and I said, what? I, I'm in comedy. How could I not know who you are? He said, people your age never know who I am, and I said, well, they should. <laughs> And he told me that, <laughs> this is rather old school, but he said, the wonderful thing about Imogene is that no matter how wild the, the bit was, uh, she was always a lady. And I never quite knew how to compute that. <laughs> but, of course, that was the 50s. And it would have been hard for a woman to, how do I say this? <sighs> to do what the comedy needed, what you knew you could do with it, how far you could go, there would be that thing that would be there that men don't feel. Is it attractive? Is it okay? It's there, whether you want it to be or not. So God bless Imogene Coca and Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett. And of course, now I have been able to work with Carol Burnett, so I can die happy. She's a, an amazing person. Um, I saw Julie Harris once in Driving Miss Daisy at the Henry Fonda Theater in oh. Hollywood. Uh, and I got to interview her beforehand, and she was 
so delightful and so business. She was about business. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was appearing with Brock Peters, who was also... Oh, God, they must have been great. They, they were great. They were great. One of the benefits of my job was getting to, to meet people and see people. Uh, would you count Carol as one of your heroes in the business? Oh, absolutely. And having worked with her, well, it was just heaven. In this show that I did, that's coming, I, we're about to do season two, Palm Royale. That show has gotten a lot of publicity. Well, wait till you see season two. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's wild. It's really something. Yeah. Do you have a guilty pleasure TV show? Do I? Let me see. Um, if we were to, oh, okay. Well, no, I don't like to say that because then it sounds like it's a bad TV show. Oh. So I can't say that about a TV show. Okay. If we were to drop in at your house one night during the week, what would we catch you watching? Well, I hate to say this, but probably British TV. Oh. So my husband and I watch so much British TV. I, it's in our wheelhouse. Comedy, Would I Lie to You, QI. I'm crazy about British comedians. I love them so much. And it, it's just our taste. We love it. And of course, the murder mysteries. Murder, comedy, we love them both. What's the scariest thing that ever happened to you on a set? Uh, well, now, let me think about that. Oh, I got hit in the head with a broadsword. I did. I did a show called Wizards and Warriors, and I played a princess, and there was a sword fight scene, and the guys had rehearsed it, and then I was there, and so they brought me over with the fight coordinator, uh, stunt coordinator, whatever you call them, fight uh, choreographer, and so they go like this with the sword, and they come around, and then you duck, and they show me this, and we practice it a couple of times. <laughs> Well, you're working with a couple of young actors, and they're doing it step by step with the fight choreographer. And then they say, action, and these young bucks, <laughs> the testosterone is going. And that thing came around so fast, and it knocked me completely down. And the director ran over and started asking me questions and asked me what year it was. <laughs> and I thought he was joking, so I didn't answer. And I panicked him for a moment. It was scary for him, I think. And on the same show, another scary thing was that I had to come face to face with a cobra. And so they were showing me how I would run up these stairs, trip, and then just above me a little bit on these stairs, on the stair is a cobra, which they would tease into striking Mm, position. Putting its hood up. And that was putting its hood up, and that was the shot. And they had plexiglass there and everything. And so we rehearsed it. I went back. I sat in my chair. (laughs) And I'm sitting there, and I see this pair of boots walking toward me. And I thought, I think I know what they're going to say. And so it was the producer and the guys. And they said, you know, we could save about 45 minutes in lighting if we didn't use the plexiglass. And the snake handler was there also. And I said, and I'm going to be face to face with a cobra. I said, do you have anti-venom on the set? (laughs) And they said, Just a curiosity. And I said, "Um, do you know the nearest place that has anti-venom? And they said, yes, Chatsworth. (sighs) And all I could think was, my husband's reaction, if he found out that they had me come face to face with a cobra that was in a strike pose, and this was not long after the Twilight Zone, mm-hmm. so it gave courage to all of us to say, uh-uh. no, I won't do that. And I said, I just can't. And they said, okay. They also knew they couldn't push it because the atmosphere in Hollywood at that time was Don't mess with this. You'll get sued. So uh, I waited, and it was painful sitting there for 45 minutes. It really took a long time to light it through plexiglass. And then I did it. They also lit something on fire at my feet in that show. Yeah, a lot of special effects in that show. And I remember the guys 
nickname, the um, special effects guy, was Boom Boom. <laughs> and he had a total of, I don't know, six or seven fingers all together. And as he was lighting this thing that went along my feet, he kept saying, trust me, darling, trust me. And I thought, your, ni- your nickname is Boom Boom. Why is that? But it went okay. Julia, thank you very much for coming in to do our little show. Thank you for having me. It was nice talking to you and seeing you again after all these years. And you look great. Oh, thank you. Oh, I hope our paths cross again someday. I hope they do. And thank you for giving me a chance to talk about Hollywood in general. I don't like it when people have assumptions because actors are the best people I've ever known. And when people not in the business talk about our business, and I don't like it when they say bad things about our business hmm. because it's really full, as you know, of wonderful people. It's kept me employed for a long time. It has. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>